Nice. Thank you. I suppose the leading prosecutor, uh, who you would like uh, from the prosecution to present their argument next as a rebuttal to Abdi's uh, initial statement. Adam Elia Cooper. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Cooper, with the power and trust of me as judge, do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, the black truth, and nothing but the truth, without fear of favour, so help you a piece of paper with jottings on it? Um, I certainly do. The floor is yours to present a rebuttal. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can swear my own book. Right. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. So um, I want to begin by thinking about the main defence um, that is often used by black Labour um, supporters um, when they're trying to convince uh, their, um, uh, their comrades to kind of join into the Labour Party. And that, of course, is the reproduction of that famous um, phrase um, popularised by Margaret Thatcher, there is no alternative. And maybe it's slightly ironic that supporters of the Labour Party reduced themselves to a phrase popularised by Margaret Thatcher in trying to convince us to vote for the Labour Party. But I'm going to try and think about it in a little bit more detail as I um, skip through three kind of broad areas of Labour Party policy. Foreign policy, economic policy, and of course, good old British justice. So Labour's foreign policy um, is, has been, I would say, fairly consistent over the years. If we start with 1919, Labour's policy platform supported the colonialism of, and, it, and I quote here, the moral, claim, the moral claims upon us of the non-adult races. And here we all are today, <laughs> past our bedtimes. <laughs> Labour's first colonial, colonial secretary, J.H. Thomas, would tolerate, quote, no mucking about with the British Empire as he sent the RAF to bomb Iraq something that they got very used to indeed. And of course, the war in Iraq um, being one of the most, one of the most damaging stains on, in, in both in Britain's history as well as the Labour Party's history should perhaps make it no surprise that when the images of what's taking place across Gaza lead many people in the Labour Party, including its leader, to have the opportunity to vote to end that carnage and say, nah, carry on. Economic policy. I would say one of the key aspects of Britain's economic policy under New Labour anyway, of course, has been privatisation. We'd probably have twice as many people here if the privatised railways weren't currently on strike. <laughs> and despite the fact that black and Asian people are overrepresented in further and higher education, that's a very, very good thing, but of course it does mean, of course, that we're now overrepresented in the enormous student debt we've been saddled with um, that Labour Party um, puts no opposition against when it was voted through back in 2010. But I think the most damaging form of privatisation that we've seen from the Labour Party has been their development of Margaret Thatcher's policies. From Margaret Thatcher's PPPs, the pu pu Public-Private Partnership, um, was transformed by Tony Blair to the PFI, the Public Finance Initiative. Privatisation of the NHS through the back door. What um, Wes Streeting, the current health sec um, Shadow Health Secretary, says we're too nostalgic about as he demands we open the door to private private entrepreneurs. Well, I would tell him that the black community is not nostalgic about healthcare. It is fundamental to our well-being. But crucially as well, these public services are fundamental to our employment, have been historically and continue to be today. And we are not nostalgic about our life or our livelihoods. We are realistic about it. But finally, of course, I want to talk a little bit about justice. Now, I think we should have all, also, of course, remember that it was, it was in the 1970s that the good old Labour Party introduced the sus laws, even if Margaret Thatcher likes to take the credit for repressing the rebellions that they led to. And as Tony Blair kneeled to pray with George W. Bush before illegally invading Iraq, killing hundreds of thousands, he then returned to domestic policy with this speech. What we are dealing with is not a generic social order but specific groups of people who, for one reason or another, are deciding not to abide by the same code of conduct, conduct as the rest of us. The black community. The vast majority of whom in these communities are decent, law-abiding people, horrified by what's happening, but they need to be mobilised in denunciation of this gang culture that's killing innocent young black kids. And we won't stop this by pretending it isn't young black kids who are doing it. 
So the racialized crimes in the war on terror, so-called black-on-black crime or being an illegal immigrant, now popularized by the culture wars um, uh, which, are, which are being fought by the Conservative Party, see their genesis under Tony Blair's New Labour. And Tony Blair's New Labour didn't just say this in word, they said it in, they did it in deed as well. Um, with Tony Blair introducing 3,000 new criminal offences, a new crime for every day that he was in office, compared to around only 500 under the previous Conservative governments over the same scale. We see more deportation done, un, un, under Tony Blair than we did under the Tories, and, and unsurprisingly, with this massive increase in, um, in uh, crimes, we see the prison population in this country almost double. More and more people being incarcerated, more and more people behind bars as we see funding for prisons, but very little for our communities. But how can, of course, Keir Starmer be held responsible for this? How possibly can we hold him responsible for this unprecedented, racist explosion in public prosecutions? Yes, indeed, Tony... Um, Keir Starmer can be held very much responsible for this explosion in the lack of justice in our justice system. He has been fundamental to the incarceration and criminalisation of our communities while crucial services are being defunded. And so I think we should be unsurprised when um, Margaret Thatcher is asked, what is, my what is your greatest legacy, Mrs Thatcher? When she can assertively say, it is new Labour. And that is what we're being asked to vote for tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Cooper. The floor is open for the defence to provide a rebuttal. Uh, Mr. Duale, who would you like to select? To 